As I've thought about this over the last couple of years, what it really struck me, also as I talked with some people and read some things, is unfortunately in this country you can get a PhD in economics with never having had a single class in accounting. Economists that cannot read a balance sheet or a P&L, and it's, it's quite amazing. Um, and so that leads to misdiagnosis and faulty prescriptions. What we wound up with, um, after uh, the period of my home is my ATM and how that came about and the, the household debt side of it, that the, mis these misguided policies to maintain a bubble level of household consumption spending through the transfer of, the, of uh, two people of the proceeds of the issuance of government debt, massive amounts of it. And so we, we've replaced to a large extent, continue to replace household debt with government debt and creating, in that sense, a different form of a bubble. Fiscal policies have become part of the problem. They are not part of the solution. And monetary policies cannot correct the mistakes made by the rest of government. Instead of greater latitude for discretion, we ought to be moving and pump priming and all that sort of thing we ought to moving, be moving towards um, letting markets uh, start to clear without artificial props and distortions. Ultimately, it's the inherent resiliency of a market economy that is going to get us out of this environment and to restore prosperity, not bubblenomics, uh, as we have learned um, in the last <coughs> couple of years. However, I worry that the lack of fiscal discipline undermines confidence that policymakers will maintain monetary discipline. I spend some time talking about the unlegislated tax of inflation, why uh, societies have resorted to that over time, why it's actually very tempting to politicians to do that, why we did it in the Johnson administration in the 60s, the tax no one has to vote for, or at least he thought so, um, and also the rather cynical resort to the inflation tax as a way to impose real taxation on people that you promised not to raise their taxes. Um, and also the international dimension uh, that people seem to either not understand or are willfully ignoring what it does to foreign holders of our currency, of our debt, and imposing a tax without representation onto a whole lot of other people around the world. And I conclude with some remarks about what should be, in my mind, the objectives of future monetary reforms and whether one sides with James Madison or Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln had said that no duty is more imperative on a government than the duty it owes the people of furnishing them with a sound and uniform currency. But Madison had said it's a challenge of monetary arrangement in spite of government, saying it cannot be doubted that a paper currency rigid, rigidly limited in its quantity to purposes absolutely necessary may be equal and even superior in value to specie. But experience does not favor reliance on such experiments. Whenever the paper has not been convertible into specie and its quantity is dependent on the policy of government, a depreciation has been produced by an undue increase or an apprehension of it. So I interpret James Buchanan as coming down on the side of Madison, saying the Constitution remains the ultimate sovereign authority rather than the government. Some 15 years earlier, in another paper, also in Cato Journal, Buchanan cautioned us, it is in the monetary responsibility that almost all constitutions have failed. Even those that were allegedly motivated originally by classical liberal precepts. Governments throughout history have almost always moved beyond constitutionally authorized limits in their monetary authority. And then I have some comments about fiscal dominance hypothesis and the concerns that um, are evident everywhere.